Hey everyone, today I'm going to be talking about the set of real numbers. Now, the set of real numbers includes two unique sets, the rational numbers, which are just fractions, and irrational numbers, which are very interesting objects. And in my view, people often take irrational numbers for granted. They learn what they are in high school, maybe, and then they never use them, ever. In fact, scientists only use fractions. They always round their numbers to the nearest so many sig figs. And by doing that, you're creating a rational number. So what are irrational numbers? Well, irrational numbers are simply an extension to the rational numbers, but they allow for the real number line to have very unique properties. And these properties feel as though they should be natural. Even though the objects that are used to enable mathematicians to have those properties seem very unnatural. Irrational numbers are not natural whatsoever. But for some reason, they seem to pop up, theoretically. And they seem very necessary in mathematics. I really do wonder if aliens would have the same math system that we have. And if they would take the rational numbers which I believe rational numbers are something that aliens would be consistent with. But I'm really curious as to whether or not aliens can construct the real number line using irrational numbers. That's something that I don't... I'm not 100% convinced that aliens would be able to do this. But maybe someone can leave me a comment and tell me what you think. So how do we construct the real line? Well, first we start with the rational numbers. Now, the rational numbers don't cover all of the number line. As you can see here, we have some rational numbers represented on the number line, but this is not the whole entire set of rational numbers. There are more numbers to fill in. Technically, all of these supposed holes should be filled in with many, 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 many rational numbers. There are infinitely many rational numbers, but apparently infinitely many rational numbers is not enough to completely fill this line so that the line is continuous. It turns out that when you fill this number line with fractions and just fractions, then you're ending up with a bunch of holes. And the question is, can we fill these holes? And that's what we do to construct the real line. Now, Descartes was a great mathematician who asked the question, can we fill in these holes with roots of polynomials? And so he was able to un interpret the square root of 2, the square root of 5 as separate from the complex numbers, the imaginary numbers. But both of these objects were oftentimes irrational which was confusing to many mathematicians at the time. Now, what's interesting is if you take the square root of 2, square root of 5, cube root of 3, and so on, if you take all of the roots, you only fill the number line partially, but you don't completely fill the number line so that it's continuous. So how do we do that? And is that next step natural? And this is where things get a little weird. I personally have no idea, and it kind of drives me nuts sometimes, wondering, is the next step a natural step? It feels like what Descartes did here was natural, because x squared equals 2 should have a solution in this natural world, because we have triangles all over the place. But what's weird is that this number line is not continuous even still. Even if you fill the holes with roots of polynomials, it turns out you don't fill in all of the holes. There are still plenty of other holes to fill. So how do we fill those holes? What are those things? And where are they exactly? Well, this is a question that Richard Dedekind was able to answer with Dedekind cuts. Richard Dedekind discovered that if you take the number line, full of fractions, by the way, just fractions, and you split that number line in two, where on the left side, every red fraction is less than every blue fraction. And on top of that, if you take any of the red fractions and square them, the numbers are going to be less than two. And if you square any of the blue fractions, 
the number, the result is going to be greater than two. So it feels as though there is a hole here. The question is whether or not we can fill this hole using a rational number. Do we even need an irrational number here? Maybe this is a fraction, right? How do we know this is not a fraction? Well, at the end of this video, later on, I'll prove that the square root of two is not a rational number, meaning that it cannot be represented as a fraction. So what Richard Dedekind discovered was the set of all blue fractions, which are upper bounds, they're all upper bounds, doesn't have a least upper bound. And this was something that was troubling because the least upper bound property is a very convenient property for an abstract mathematical object to have. And so we want the rational numbers to have that property, but unfortunately, the square root of two is not a fraction, which I'll show soon. So let's assume that there isn't a rational number to put here, that this hole is left unfilled. What exactly do we do about that? Well, Richard Dedekind would fill this hole, which he called a Dedekind cut, with an irrational number. He just kind of created the object. He decided that the object exists in the math universe. And do you see how that process is slightly unnatural? You see, with fractions, you can interpret fractions in the real world by relating two natural numbers. And the relative size is a fraction, a rational number. So rational numbers appear in the natural world all the time. But... Filling holes with irrational numbers is not necessarily something that you would expect the natural world to do. So when you think about any variables like time or distance, it's really hard to say that those things are continuous. They're probably not. So when Richard Dedekind discovered all of these holes, he said, hey, let's fill in all of them. We'll fill every single possible least upper bound. And this brought Richard Dedekind's interpretation of the real number line from the algebraic number line to the actual real number line, the one that is actually continuous. There are no holes here because we filled them. We decided to fill them with these objects that we decided exists. What else did we decide exists? Well, we decided that there's a number that if you square it, you get negative one. It's called I. That's another example of when we just decided that a mathematical object exists. So do you understand why I say that irrational numbers are not very natural? And there are a lot of implications to this. Is time a continuous quantity? Probably not. Probably not. But I'm not a physicist. Maybe these physicists can help us out with that. Now, I want to mention that the square root of 2 was a Dedekind cut that was filled and you can prove that the square root of 2 is an irrational number. It cannot be represented as a fraction. But there are a lot of irrational numbers. And I mean a lot of irrational numbers. So when I say that we're going to fill all of the least upper bounds, we're going to fill the Dedekind cuts with least upper bounds, I mean even the ones that are completely insane. So there are some interesting constructions of irrational numbers. And so, for example, pi is an irrational number, and proving that is incredibly challenging. This is the shortest proof I can find on Wikipedia. There were several different proofs, and this was the shortest. After Richard Dedekind discovered his Dedekind cuts, George Cantor proved a really interesting phenomenon about the real number line. Namely, that the real number line has more objects than the natural numbers. Now, they're both infinite in size, and I want you to really wrap your mind around what that actually means. Now, another property that the real number line has is what's called the Archimedean property, and a lot of people just kind of shrug this off as just some typical property that is obvious, almost like an axiom, like we should just assume that this thing is true. But it turns out that the Archimedean property is a really important property to wrap your mind around conceptually. So Euclid said it best when he said that magnitudes are said to have a ratio to one another which can, emphasis on can, when multiplied, exceed one another. So basically the Archimedean property says that you can take any one quantity A and measure quantity B. Now you can't, you don't necessarily need to be able to measure it perfectly, but you can get 
a little bit over. It's possible to go over. This is the Archimedean property. Now you might say, okay, so we can measure things, but why is it important to measure things? Why is it important to measure relative sizes? Well, I'm glad you asked. There are two very interesting examples that I am absolutely in love with. So there are the hyper real numbers. These contain the real numbers. The hyper real numbers is not a set. It's a class. And I have a video on what the difference between a class and a set is. You should check that out. It turns out that the hyperreals is a non-Archimedean. It turns out that the notion of distance with the hyperreals is non-Archimedean. And so the concept of distance, the concept of measuring is very different with the hyperreals than it is with the real number line. Same is true for the piadic numbers. The piadic numbers have a very unique metric. And so the Archimedean property gives this sort of intuitive geometry, one that we can all kind of wrap our minds around. Whereas the geometry of the piadic numbers and the geometry of the hyperreal numbers is something that is still incredibly misunderstood. All right, now that we've covered everything that I wanted to discuss in this video, I wanted to prove the claims that I made earlier. First, we're gonna prove that the square root of two is not a rational number. This was a claim I made earlier, and because it's not a rational number, Richard Dedekind was like, well then what is it? Okay, so let's prove this statement. The way we're gonna prove this statement is we're gonna assume that the square root of two is a rational number. This is the only assumption that we're going to make, and we're going to lead ourselves into a contradiction, which would then mean that our assumptions are all wrong. So what does it mean for the square root of 2 to be a rational number? That means it could be represented as a fraction, and we can reduce that fraction so that the greatest common divisor is 1, and so we don't have to simplify this fraction, p over q. We can also guarantee that q is non-zero and that both p and q are integers. Now, squaring both sides of this equation simplifies to 2 equals p squared over q squared. Now, we can multiply both sides by q squared since q is non-zero, which gives us 2q squared equals p squared. Now, I want you to notice something about that equation. 2 times something equals p squared. Well, since 2 times something equals p squared, then that means 2 divides p squared. Now, since 2 divides p squared, then that means 2 divides p. Now, this is a phenomenon that you should probably prove by yourself. I'll leave that one as an exercise. Okay, so now we know that 2 divides p. But 2 divides p just means that p equals 2 times k for some integer k. And since p equals 2k, we can plug that in to get 2q squared equals 2k all squared. which we can then simplify to 2q squared equals 4k squared, and then divide both sides by 2 to get q squared equals 2k squared. Now I want you to notice that this says that q squared equals 2 times some integer. Well, since q squared equals 2 times some integer, that means 2 divides q squared, which means that 2 divides q. And again, that's an exercise that you need to work out. But that just means that both p and q are divisible by 2. That 2 divides p and 2 divides q. But that contradicts But that contradicts the fact that the greatest common divisor between p and q is 1. So why does 2 divide both of them? That's a contradiction. And this is where we finally prove that the assumption that the square root of 2 is a rational number is false, meaning that the square root of 2 is not a rational number, then what is it? Well, we call it a, a rational number and we just decide that the object exists in the same way that we decide imaginary numbers exist. In many ways, irrational numbers are just as fake as imaginary numbers. So next up, I want to show that the real number line satisfies the Archimedean property. This proof is a little bit more tricky to wrap your mind around. 
So the Archimedean property says that if x and y are real numbers and x is greater than zero, then there exists a natural number n such that n times x is greater than y, meaning that you can measure quantity y with quantity x using n x's, a total of n of them, n x's. <laughs> so n is the number of x's that we have. x is the ruler and y is the thing that we're measuring. And we can guarantee that we can measure y with a sufficient number of rulers, n of them specifically. That's what the Archimedean property says. So let's prove the Archimedean property for the real number line. We're gonna assume x and y are real numbers and that x is greater than zero. Now, why does x have to be greater than zero? Because x is the ruler and you need to make sure that the ruler has a positive length so that we ensure that lengths are positive. Keep in mind that distance functions cannot output negative numbers. All right, so we're gonna prove this using proof by contradiction. So we're gonna assume the negation of our conclusion in this implication here. So we're gonna instead suppose that for every natural number that n times x is less than y, meaning that you cannot measure y with a sufficient amount of x's. So we're assuming that the Archimedean property does not hold for the real number line. Now, since x is greater than zero, we can take this equation and divide both sides by x to show that n is less than y over x. So this then means that for every natural number n, n is less than y over x. I want you to wrap your mind around that. 100 is less than y over x. 2000 is less than y over x. 1 billion is less than y over x, and so on. Every natural number, is less than y over x. You cannot use enough x's to measure y. And that just means that the natural numbers are bounded above by y over x. Now this is where things get interesting. Since the natural numbers is a subset of the real numbers, where the real numbers has the least upper bound property, and since six says that the natural numbers is bounded above, then the natural numbers has the a least upper bound. So let B be that least upper bound. So basically the natural numbers are a part of the real numbers. The real numbers has the least upper bound property, so therefore the natural numbers has the least upper bound property. Now there is an upper bound for the natural numbers. We found that Y over X is an upper bound to the natural numbers. So because the natural numbers supposedly has an upper bound, then we can find the least upper bound because the natural numbers has the least upper bound property. So we're gonna grab that least upper bound, we'll call it B. Now, notice how B minus one is less than B. And B minus one cannot be an upper bound to the natural numbers because B is the least upper bound. So if you subtract anything from the least upper bound, then you cannot have another upper bound. It's impossible. So B minus one cannot be an upper bound to the natural numbers. Now, what does that mean? Well, since B minus one is not an upper bound to the natural numbers, then there is a natural number M such that M is greater than B minus one. Now, since M is a natural number, then that means that M plus one is also a natural number. Now, if we take that inequality, m is greater than b minus one from number nine, and we add one on both sides, that gives us m plus one is greater than b. But let's remember what b is. Let's try to remember what b is. b is supposedly the least upper bound to the natural numbers. And here we have a natural number that's greater than the least upper bound, the least upper bound. We have a natural number that's greater than an upper bound. Hmm. Hmm. M plus one is larger than the least upper bound of the natural numbers. That's a contradiction. Now, there is this diagonalization argument that I highly recommend you take a look at if you want to understand why the real number line has a much larger cardinality than the natural numbers, meaning that there are more real numbers than there are natural numbers. Either I'll have a video on this soon, 
or I'll put a link in the description of my favorite video that I think you should check out so that you can understand the diagonalization argument that Cantor discovered. This is a really, really great argument and it's used heavily in mathematics. Anyways, thanks everyone. This video was really fun to make and I look forward to making more of these in the near future. Thanks everyone and I'll see you in the next video.